Have you ever heard the saying, no good deed goes unpunished? Such a great saying. It's such a great saying because all great sayings, some of them are sober and serious and have kind of the smell of menace and death on them because they want to warn you of something. Others like this are kind of humorous, but the idea is simple that there are occasions in your life when you will greatly extend yourself on behalf of someone else. Maybe it was financial, maybe it was time, certainly it was love or listening or support or advocacy or you took a chance on them because they'd blown their lives apart and you took a chance to help them get it back. And for a while things were good, but then they turned on you and made you regret the day you met them, much less the day you helped them. Does that happen to anybody? It's happened to me two or three times. Don't worry, no names are ever mentioned from this pulpit. All those secrets are kept in pastoral confidentiality, but it happens. We sometimes extend ourselves in good deeds and end up suffering for them. And the reason I ask is I'm not sure that saying existed in that form in the first century, but as I've read across 2 Corinthians, I have wondered if Paul had his own version or whether we could sit down with the Apostle Paul and teach him that saying if he didn't know it already, if he wouldn't have laughed a grim little laugh in recognition of what the Corinthian church had put him through. We've been moving through 2 Corinthians for quite a while, so you'll, if you've been here for even most of that journey, you know that this second letter that he wrote the Corinthian church that we have in our New Testaments is one of his most open, vulnerable, and personal letters. Here's the backdrop, and here's where we're going to go today. It is through Paul's courage and suffering that the Corinthian church heard about Jesus in the first place. The city of Corinth in modern-day Greece, in a world filled with dark paganism and out-of-control immorality, even in that world, the Corinthians were outliers. They were extra bad in a bad, bad world. So much so that they had na turned the name of their city into a verb in the ancient world. If you Corinthianized, you were really, really debauched and lost. Have one of our family jokes is, please make sure that the community never uses our name as a verb. Okay? We don't want to be, we don't want our last name to stand for shenanigans. That's the kind of people the Corinthians were. Through Paul's own personal courage and sacrifice, he had taken them the witness of Jesus, same good news, same ancient message we've just been singing about, we've been celebrating, I've been praying over. Paul took them that true message. Some of them were saved, an actual legitimate, apparently financially strong church with a lot of spiritual gifts was born, and at least for a while with all of their immaturity, they brought a lot of joy to Paul's heart, but then as it happened everywhere Paul went, some false teachers crept in behind him and started making some really shady, unfair, and untruthful comparisons between themselves and Paul. They had a lot of claims about the kinds of people they were in the next chapter. Today we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, but if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you're going to discover that Paul made up a term for them. He calls them, with a little bit of sarcasm maybe, the super apostles. Okay? These are the elite, at least, in their own mind. What kind of people were they? Well, they boasted of several things. They said, you know, Paul's always one step ahead of an angry mob. We arrived here with letters of recommendation. Other people vouch for us. Their claim apparently was if they were a product on Amazon, they would have a five-star review. They also claimed that they had spiritual visions. They had spiritual insight revealed personally to them and privately to them by God that Paul and others knew nothing about. The message from Paul, according to their claim, seems to be outdated, poorly understood, poorly worded, weakly taught. And they said not only that, 
Paul's always talking about going from here to there, but we travel a lot more than he does. We cover a lot more territory. When we speak, people listen to us. You can check our reviews. You can check our itinerary. If you sit with us for a little while, we'll tell you spiritual things that you've never even heard of. Don't listen to Paul. He's a weak pretender, and one of the reasons life is so hard for him is that he knows it and God knows it. God never blesses this man. He's always going hungry. He's always in jail. He's always being in, thrown into prison or beaten by a mob or beaten by the authorities because God never sent him. He's not real. Now, I'm telling you something from nearly 2,000 years ago. That's literally ancient history. But if you can just, if you're well acquainted with contemporary American evangelical culture, can you hear some things from the American church in 2023 in the testimony of the super apostles? There's a little bit of it, and social media and the internet have fueled it so much more. We're all about the age of branding. It's always been awkward and very, it's a cringeworthy moment for me, but on more than one occasion, I've had sincere Christians ask me what my personal brand is. And listen, I'm not denying I'm not gifted, but I'm well acquainted and very supportive of clear communication, of microphones that work, of lights that help people see of a communication that is appealing and helps people understand the message of Jesus better. But to be perfectly clear, pastors don't have a personal brand. We're not the point. We're not the message. We don't want anybody to have such focus on the messenger that they lose track of the message. The message is Christ. The message is the good news of Jesus living being tempted, dying, and rising again to save sinners, which include all of us, including the people who have the privilege of representing Him, who, by the way, includes you. You're not a spectator. You're not a, you are a participant. You are in God's family. But these super apostles, I think, would have fit in really well in a social media-driven world. They were intensely concerned about what people thought of them. They were quick to roll out their credentials in their portfolio and show other people how personally impressive, how deeply spiritual, how very knowledgeable they were. What I'm trying to tell you is Christ, the Christian faith from the time they were Christians, because sin never stops, has always had its posers, has always had its power brokers. And among all those pretenders... By God's grace, also, there are some real pastors. Open your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And I'd like to share with you from Paul's explanation and defense how you can tell if a Christian minister is legit. That's what Paul has in mind here. You say, well, this has very little to do with my day-to-day -day life. Give me just a second. Let me try to persuade you and plead with you to listen attentively to everything that Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, because there, there's maybe more there for you than you actually imagine. The first thing that, it need, that you need to learn from what Paul tells you about authentic Christian ministers and authentic Christian ministry is you need to develop your own sense of discernment about what other people representing Christ and teaching in His name are giving to you. We live in an age where, for some people, the least important and the smallest amount of spiritual information they derive in their, in their average week is the gathered church they worship with. That's just a little tiny portion of the spiritual input they receive during the week. Why? Because all week they're awash in podcasts. All week they're connected to YouTube. If they have social media, they may be getting very persuasively made, powerfully produced spiritual sound bites in 10 or 15 seconds. You need discernment to tell whether the people who are reaching into your life, who are asking for your trust and your heart and mind in the name of Christ, whether they're real. You need discernment. Since you're part of this congregation as well, you need to hold everyone who ministers here, beginning with the senior pastor, to this biblical standard. 
The standards are not something that any committee or pulpit committee or hiring committee needs to create. The standards were carefully written down by God in Scripture. And thirdly, and just as importantly, perhaps most importantly of all, if you have any desire to obey Jesus yourself and serve Christ, even if you're not in vocational ministry, in other words, even if you're never on a church payroll, every single Christian who knows Christ is also a minister of Christ. It may not be public. It may never involve putting a mic on your head. It may never involve the lights shining on you, but every single one of you, the moment you were saved by Christ, was deployed to serve other people. These are not only Christian vocational ministry standards, these are ministry and character standards for you. Here's how we can tell if we're being discerning, if we're being true, if we're being faithful. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Paul said, I, Paul, myself, entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away, I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on, showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh." Now, what does that dense couple of sentences mean? Well, Paul's engaging with his critics, and one of their main criticisms is this. Paul's a fake tough guy. If you pay attention, his letters are really, really strong, but when he shows up in person, he's a weak, sad little man. Don't listen to him. Listen to us. So Paul's going to engage directly with the criticism. And today I'm only looking with you in chapter 10, but if you keep reading in chapter 11, Paul humbly says regarding his own speech that he agrees with them. He doesn't seem to be particularly articulate. Paul seems to agree that he actually is a better writer than he is a speaker. Now, there may be good reason for that. Paul has been beaten half to death many times, left for dead on more than one occasion, if Paul were here, you would probably have a hard time looking at him. He was physically unimpressive, and this is just the sort of thing that his critics are using to attack him. But look at his heart. Look at the kind of man Paul is. I, Paul, myself, entreat you. There's a word we don't use very often. I like the word treat, but entreat, that's a different word. What does that mean exactly? English teachers? SAT high scorers, anybody? <laughs> what does it mean to entreat? To beg. to beg. I, Paul, myself, plead with you, beg you, entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Paul is basing his appeal on humility, first characteristic of someone who is legitimately following and serving Jesus well. Number one, under stress, their character is humble, but not weak. Listen to it. I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. That's his sarcastic voicing of the criticism he's under. I beg of you for the second time. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. Garner translation, some people are saying that we operate in a worldly standard, that we are self-made, self-appointed men. And the proof, they say, is Paul's really tough when he's writing. He's very eloquent and powerful when he's writing, but he's a sad little man in person. I'm pleading with you, Paul says, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ that I don't have to show up in person and show how strong I can actually be. This is the first and perhaps the most important characteristic of Christians and Christian ministers. It's the rarest of gifts. It's the greatest spiritual attainment. It's rare and a treasure if you find it. It's humility, especially when our character is being attacked and when we find ourselves under stress. Where did I get that idea? I got that idea from Jesus. Look at Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. 
This is the only place in the New Testament where Jesus speaks of his own heart. This is an important verse. Jesus is going to issue an invitation to Christians to come under his teaching, to submit to him. He's not inviting, in other words, peers to come alongside him. He's not inviting, inviting an equal partnership. He's inviting people to take his teaching onto themselves, to submit themselves to his person, his character, his ethic, his plan, his methods. And here's how Jesus describes himself. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Let's take it a bit at a time. In this relationship, in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, who's in charge? We're studying the Bible together now. <laughs> Every once in a while, I step out of the monologue, and I invite you to study the Bible with me. In this invitation, who's in charge? Jesus is. How do you know? It's His yoke on you. You're taking His teaching. You're conforming to His plan. It's not going to be what you want. It's going to be what He wants. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Here's a novel concept. There's nothing you can teach Jesus. You can delight Him. You can sadden Him. But you can't teach Him anything. He knows everything already. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And here's the surprising part. He's referring to his own heart. For I am, what's it say there? Gentle and lowly in heart. You come and you submit to me and you learn from me. I'm going to be in charge. But here's the greatest thing. You're going to find me gentle and lowly in heart. And according to Jesus, what is the effect that this is going to have on you? You're going to find rest for your soul. See, the trouble with being a poser and a power broker is it's exhausting. Under wise counsel I've received from other people, when I'm meeting with someone for personal pastoral counseling, one of the first things I ask them is if they're exhausted and anxious and worn out, particularly if they're a young person, I ask them about their life on social media. Because something devastating is happening to people who invest a lot of time in social media. They spend a lot of time thinking about how to present themselves to the world. And the lighting and the captions and the hashtags. And who's going to like it and who's going to share it? And what are other people thinking about me? Listen to the counter invitation. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. See, these super apostles, their chief claim was, we're important, we're strong, we're well-known, we're invited places. When we speak, people listen, and when we show up, we make a big impact. It doesn't actually sound a lot like the Lord. And as our country descends into further chaos, and we move further and further away, not only from good common sense, but particularly from the values in the heart of Christ, there's a pushback from the conservative Christian side. People who love Scripture, love Jesus, have a high view of Scripture, in my personal considered opinion, are falling into something that tempts them to not be like Christ in these troubled days. Because I've heard many Christians, including well-known Christian leaders, say, this is not the time for gentleness. This is not the time for meekness. This is not the time for humility. We have to be strong. We have to fight. We have to do all these things. And in so doing, they discard the way Jesus himself describes his own heart. They focus on one thing that is true about Jesus and exclude all the others. And here's the thing. If you exclude something that is true about a person, any person, including Christ, you are no longer dealing with that person. You're dealing with your own reshaping and remaking of that person as you imagine them or want them to be. So let me ask you specifically, I'm speaking specifically to the men, are you okay with Jesus being gentle? Does that fit with your idea of masculine strength? 
Can a strong man be humble? Consider Christ. The same Jesus that famously flipped the tables also took little children into his arms and blessed them, wept over cities and wept over sinners, stooped down in the dirt to write something beside a sobbing woman. Which is it? He's all of it. He's both the lion and the lamb. He's stronger than you can even imagine, more gentle and more humble and lowly of heart than you ever thought about being. And this is the invitation that Jesus has for Christians and for churches and for pastors. This is what gives actual legitimacy. There is no hypocrisy with Jesus. And an application for you, mature Christians grow into being the same person in public or private because Jesus is always the same person. Now, every word in that sentence is carefully chosen. You know how many hypocrites came to church this morning? All of them. Every single one of us. There's not a single person that has ever been in this room who has ever had this mic who is not a hypocrite in some measure. But the point of being Christ-like is that you slowly set aside hypocrisy and you embrace truth. In other words, you actually become a person like Jesus. And Jesus is never a hypocrite. Jesus is always the same. He is eternally and forever the same person. So the more you walk with Him and learn from Him, the more you are the same person in public or in private. And that is very important in this social media, YouTube-driven age because I can tell you no names except one. Our own brother Ray Comfort is one of the very, very few famous Christians I have met who is exactly the same person in public as he is in private. Without, almost without exception, the truly famous huge platform Christians I have met, the vast majority have been, have been disappointing in private. One guy in particular, and I would never name any names because we all have bad days and someone's saying the same thing about me somewhere today. But one guy in particular was so noxious in private, I was thinking to myself, sir, sir, please, please be quiet. I'm going to have to go home and throw away all your books if you say one more thing. That's not the Spirit of Christ. Becoming more like Christ makes you self-forgetful. It makes you humble. Listen to C.S. Lewis say what humility is. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity says this, do not imagine that if you meet a really humble man, he will be what most people call humble nowadays. He will not be a sort of greasy, smarmy person who is always telling you that, of course, he is nobody. Probably all you will think about him is that he seemed a cheerful, intelligent chap who took a real interest in what you said to him. If you do dislike him, it will, because, it will be because you feel a little envious of anyone who seems to enjoy life so easily. Listen, he will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. If anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell him the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud, and a biggish step too. At least nothing whatever can be done before it. If you think you are not conceited, it means you are very conceited indeed. C.S. Lewis, as he generally does, hits the target. The first sign of authentic Christianity and Christian ministry is self-forgetfulness, humility under stress. Number two is this. Real Christian ministers in the Spirit and in the power of Christ use spiritual weapons rather than earthly techniques to bring people to Christ. Look in verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, in other words, though we are ordinary human beings, though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. In other words, they're not human plans, they're not human techniques, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. This is military language. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. In other words, Corinthians, regardless of how distant we've become and how difficult our relationship is, we're with you all the way through. 
Our intention as your ministers is to bring you fully in obedience to Christ, but Paul's point is we're not going to do that with mere earthly techniques. We're not going to be personally persuasive. Verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have what kind of power? Divine power, God's own power to destroy strongholds. What are you talking about, Paul? He's talking about where spirituality lives, which is the conflict between truth and lies. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to Christ. My question for you, in the tw- this is 2,000 years old. In the 21st century, are there arguments made against the knowledge of God? Are there strong ideas, what Paul will call strongholds, that have taken control of our collective national consciousness to speak to us things that are not true according to God's own Word? Are there any places in our culture, in our country, including evangelical subculture, where we can see that there is a clash between what Christ says and what the world wants us all to do and say and be and celebrate? Do you see any conflicts out there at all? They're constant. They're daily. They're pervasive. But notice, Paul says that the key to the fight is not earthly strength. It's not human intelligence. It's not mere personal persuasiveness. No. Verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power. In other words, a God-given truth-based view of reality is given by the Holy Spirit, not by smooth-talking people. We live in such a dangerous age. And at the risk of being the old guy who's so suspicious of the internet, I think even a 13 or a 14-year-old who's self-aware will tell you just what a sea change, what an overwhelming change the internet has had on hearts, minds, cultures, habits, families. It has changed everything. It has the immense power to deliver in 10 or 15 seconds Something that is so well produced, so persuasive, so incisive, so inviting that truths that God has always known and always said are swept away in a flood of emotion. And I'm not denying and decrying emotion. God made us emotional and God gave us minds and God gave us wills and what God wants in all of that is all the person we are. All of our emotions, all of our cognitive abilities, all of our purposing abilities, our will, all of that to be subjected to the obedience to Christ. In other words, there's a war on and Paul says the only way it's actually won is with spiritual power, with the power of Christ and the Holy Spirit, not with being better, being stronger, producing a better video. Thirdly, Paul says that such Christian ministers, authentic Christians and ministries are secure in their identity in Christ. Verse 7, look at what is before your eyes. In other words, Paul's saying, deal in reality. Look at what should be plain to you. If anyone is confident that he is Christ's, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. Quick little sidebar, look carefully at verse 8. Paul says that spiritual authority is given by God for a specific reason. What is it? Excuse me? to build other people up. Illegitimate Christian ministers, Christian ministers who have lost the plot and are off track, use the spiritual authority and the spiritual trust that people give them to tear them down. Christ never does. Christ will show you the holiness and the law of God to humble you to make you give up on your own best thinking, to make you give up on the stronghold ideas that have held you captive, but the intention is never to tear you down. The intention is always to save you, to build you up. 
Paul says in verse 9, I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters, for they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. In other words, the people who are saying they know Christ, we know Him too. Other people who say they are Christians, we are too. And please don't be confused if, our, if my faltering speech and my letter, strong letters seem very different. I'm always the same person. Verse 12, not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves. Listen, here's the poser. When they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one, an, with one another, they are without, what's it say? Understanding. They're not wise. This is the comparison game that feeds insecurity, that denies actual spiritual authority, that moves people away from the rest we should all have in our security in Christ. People who are secure in Christ do not need to compare or compete. They are who they are in Christ. If they have anything, it's because Jesus gave it to them. If they have any spiritual power, it's because it, they belong to Him. If their sins are forgiven, it's by His grace. If they have an ability to do ministry, it's because He entrusted it to them. It's all about Jesus, never about them. And secure Christians use power to build people up, not tear them down. This is vitally important especially with the comparison game that can chronically be played because of 24-7 communication in the convenience of your pocket or purse, Christians need to be done with comparisons. There's only one point of comparison, and His name is Jesus. And you'll never reach His stature, but by His grace, you already have His identity. You already have His name. He's already given you His righteousness, so you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to compete. You don't have to compare. You don't have to engage in self-loathing. You don't have to engage in loathing anybody else. You are secure in Christ, and whatever He has assigned to you, whatever ability He's given you, you can use that to build people up, not tear them down. In this age, people spend a lot of time on comparisons, and that's always a cancer. Comparison never works. Because if you win the comparison, it tempts you to pride, and if you lose the comparison, it tempts you to depression and self-loathing. That's why Paul says they have no understanding. Listen, if you let me choose the room, I can always be the best guy in the room. <laughs> I can be the best athlete in any room as long as you let me choose who else gets to go in the room with me. It might have to be preschoolers, <laughs> but I'm still in a stage where I can dominate two-year-olds at dodgeball mostly. There's a couple prodigies out there that might get me out. Paul says that's what's happening with the super apostles. They've formed their own self-appointed club. They're comparing themselves with one another. They're speaking ill of Christ, and Paul doesn't compare at all. He just says, if you belong to Christ, good. Just remember, so do I. Fourthly, and we're nearly done, Legitimate Christian ministers stick to their God-given ministry even while they try to reach more people for Christ. Look at verse 15. We do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another and another areas of influence. What's Paul saying? These super apostles who are traveling everywhere and have a better, more busier itinerary than Paul does, Paul gently reminds them, listen, we may not have been everywhere, but we got to Corinth. You know Christ because we took the preaching of Christ to you. Here's our hope, Corinthians, that your faith would grow and that with your help and your support, we will go not only to continue ministering to you, but we will go beyond you and preach the gospel in lands where the gospel is not yet known. Why is that? Because self 
Christians who are content in Christ and peaceful in their Christian identity, they're happy to stay in their own lane. They don't have to begrudge the success of other ministers. They don't have to look at the success of the gospel elsewhere and explain why it's all smoke and mirrors and marketing and they're just making stuff up and they're doing this, that, and the other thing. To be very clear, if churches around this city are prospering, you know what we should say? Praise the Lord. If they're real churches, if they love Christ and they preach the gospel, let's be grateful for every church, every Christian school, and every ministry that thrives because genuine Christian ministry pursues discipleship, not popularity or market share. We're in the disciple-making business, not in the business of attracting attention to ourselves. Jesus deserves all the attention anyone can give Him, and He will always use it well. The entire intent of this ministry is not to make ourselves look better. It's not specifically and practically only to grow. It's to grow because the gospel is being preached from this corner and around the world. Incidentally, on your way out to my left, the very in the back of the room, we've got a couple mission trips going, including for the first time we're going to Slovakia. If you'd like to go on an evangelistic and disciple-making trip with us, please stop by that table. Look at verse 17 now. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. This is literally the bottom line of Paul's life and the conclusion of this chapter. Legitimate Christian ministries are not so concerned with what others say. They hear it, and it matters to them. You can hear Paul's hurt and his occasional indignation that he of all people has had to face these kinds of attacks from this specific church that wouldn't exist if it were not for him preaching Christ to them. But at the end of the day, what keeps Paul secure and humble and moving forward is this, legitimate Christian ministers seek the Lord's approval above all. That's the fifth and sealing trait of legitimate Christian ministry. Legitimate Christian ministers seek the Lord's approval above all. There's all kinds of things. If you set yourself out, Christian, in the name of Christ to serve other people, let me give you some advance on 33 years of pastoral ministry. Let me give you the benefit of my experience. You set out to serve people in the name of Christ, not everybody will appreciate it. Some will receive it with gratitude and join you in God's family and you can celebrate Jesus with them here on earth and for the rest of eternity, but not everybody's going to dig it. I hate to break it to you. Not everybody's going to think your motives are on the level. Some of them are going to think your ministry comes up short. Some are going to think that you're weak or self-involved or self-promoting or you name it. They said it about Jesus. They said it about Paul. Guess what? They'll certainly say it about you and me. What keeps you going? The Lord's approval. The sacred awareness that you really serve in a sea of people, but to an audience of one. That there really is only one person who truly knows your heart, and praise be to Jesus, the one who truly knows your heart has a gentle and lowly heart himself. He's compassionate and loving and tender, and He put His own strong life on the cross so that He could give you eternal life, so that you could have the very life of Jesus. So please, dear Christian, seek the Lord's approval. Don't let the gratitude and the appreciation of others be your guide. Take it if it comes. Thank God for it if anyone appreciates you, encourage you, but make sure that the Lord's approval is what you're really after because Christian ministers, really legitimate Christian ministers, Remind people of Christ while bringing people to Him. That's the kind of church we need to be. We need to be the kind of church that reminds people of Jesus. And if they hated Him, let them hate us, but only for the reasons that they hated Him. Let's be sure they don't reject us because of us. Let's make sure that if we are to be rejected, it will only be because of Him and faithfulness to Him. Let us remind people... Whether we succeed or fail, let us remind people of Jesus while we bring people to Jesus. That's what it looks like to have a real Christian ministry. Will you pray with me, please? 
If you don't know Christ and you've been putting him off, can I invite you in this closing minute to turn to him and ask him to be your savior, put him in charge, take that yoke upon you? And I've been talking about authentic Christianity. Friend, brother, sister, how does yours look? That chapter really sobered me up. I have some changes to make. I have some course corrections ahead of me. Maybe you do too. Can I just give you a moment to talk to Jesus and to put him, yourself back at his disposal, put yourself under his service, take the yoke upon you, learn again from him?